Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Tomás Tubbert joins Stuart Childs to give insight into the Pasture Profit Index, including the new utilisation sub-index. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday's Let's Talk Dairy. Um, today, I'm joined by Tomás Tubbert, who's a researcher in uh, Chagas and Moorpark, and Tomás's work is focusing on grazing utilisation. So you might be familiar with the star ratings that came onto the PBI um, this year. Uh, so now different to EBI, we have PBI, which is trying to develop grasses that are more suited to Irish dairy farm systems. And Tomás's work is additional on top of this now in terms of the seeds that are being uh, generated through the breeding programs obviously need to produce grass that's grazable or uh, palatable to cows. And I suppose we used to always work off of the quality index in that, in that sense. But Tomás's work now is using the plot trials, I suppose, but actually grazing the plot trials with the cows to see what way they graze out these swords. Uh, some very interesting work and probably turning things a little bit in their heads a small bit sometimes to us as well mm-hmm. and creating some questions more than answers at times also sometimes so yeah you might uh, you'll just uh, go through your de- the details of what work you've done today so and explain how they have may have a role for farmers in terms of the seeds that they're going to be using into the future so and thanks for coming on this morning yeah so um good morning everyone and like uh, Stuart said i'm here in moore park and um uh, variety evaluation is um, my focus. Yeah, I also want to acknowledge Michael O'Donovan. He's uh, heavily involved in this uh, project as well. So I um, also acknowledge him. So starting off, the pasture profit index. What is it? It's essentially, it's an economic merit index or in simple terms, it's a, a ranking table for perennial ryegrass varieties. So just ranks of varieties on based on the best variety down to the not the worst variety, but um, maybe just not as good, or maybe just becoming outclassed, maybe older varieties that have been on the list maybe 10 or 12 years. So um, it's a variety selection tool. So when farmers are receding, and it's used by the seed industry as well, when like Skull Crop, Germinal, DLF are giving advice, they'll consult the past profit index, but it's used to select varieties when receding. And then as Stuart said, it's also kind of used as grass breeders. Grass breeders would use it to kind of point where they're going with their breeding selections. So they want varieties that perform well in these lists. So they're going to pick varieties that perform well in these traits within the index. So um, the pasture profit index itself is made up of traits that influence farm profitability. And these are uh, seasonal herbage yield. So that's your spring, summer and autumn herbage yield. It's your, um, the quality. The quality is measured as dry matter digestibility in mid-season. Mid-season being April, May, June, July. Uh, the silage sub-index, so obviously silage yield is going to affect how much uh, feed you can carry in into the winter. Um, the persistency sub-index, and this will dictate how often you have to actually reseed a paddock, and reseeding is quite a cost, so that's why that's important. And uh, the grazing utilisation sub-index, and this is essentially a measure of animal graze and how well these plots are grazed, or which are preferred by the actual cows grazing. So this is how the pasture profit index looks. Um, you can see the varieties are on the left hand side and then their trade values are here in the middle. And you can see that for, this is the 2021 list and you can see that Aberclyde was the top variety in 2021. And uh, that's based on its total PPI figure of 225. And then you can see that Grace Hill had a value of 222, Abergain at 212. And what, what those um, 225 and those values are, it's essentially the sum of uh, all the values to the right of that. So they're the sub indices and that they're the spring, summer and autumn quality, silage and persistency. So the sum of all those gives you that value of 225. So you can see here that Aberclyde, it's a, quite a good performer across all the traits. Um, but then if you go down the list, you'll see that some varieties might be lower within some of the traits, uh, some values even having negative values for those traits. So, um, when choosing varieties or strengths and weaknesses that farmers and the industry needs to be, uh, take care of when they're, um, you know, advising or selecting mixers. So um, the data that feeds into the PPI is derived from three different sources. And um, these are, so it's the agronomic forms of varieties are assessed in plot trials, like you can see in the photo there. And um, so the first one is the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines simulated grazing uh, protocol. 
And as you can imagine, simulated grazing is um, eight to 10 cuts per year. They're harvested when the average herbage cover is about 1,400 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And uh, from these trials, then we're getting the seasonal yield. Uh, so the yield of those varieties across the year. And we're also getting the mid-season quality measurements. So similar to the simulated grazing, we have the DAFM general purpose one. And again, the varieties are going to be sown in plots like in the photo, except they're managed in a different um, system. So that consists of the spring grazing, and then the varieties are going to be fertilized um, as in a silage protocol, closed for eight weeks, cut for first cut silage um, around the start of June. Then they're going to be fertilized again, closed for another five or six weeks, and then cut for a second cut silage. And um, that's what gives us the two sided yields. And then finally, the final uh, source of data is the Chagas Moor Park variety grazing trials. And these are the trials I've been conducting the past number of years. And this is giving us data for the uh, utilization sub index in the PPI for this year. So then the agronomic performance of these varieties in the trials is compared to the base. And the base is essentially the national average. So if the average variety, the average sward in Ireland, uh, is growing about nine to 10 tons per year. Um, about six tons of that is grown in summer, for example. And um, the varieties, these new varieties, maybe tend to be grown maybe six or maybe six and a half to seven tons. And you're comparing that seven tons to the national average of about six tons. And uh, that's the agronomic advantage then is that half ton or ton over the base or the national average. And then what we do with the uh, agronomic advantage is we multiply that by the economic value. And uh, the economic value of um, a trait is essentially uh, the additional profit created from a change in the value of those uh, traits. So um, the example I have here, if you sow a variety with increased summer yield, you're going to have increased grass growth. Uh, that's going to increase the number of animals that can be stocked on your farm if your land area is fixed. Uh, increased milk in the tank, increased profit. So. Um, how it's done is the increase in yield is modeled by Lawrence Lou and his team. And then that gives us the economic value for, so for summer yield, that was four cent per kilogram. If you increase your yield by one kilogram of dry matter per hectare, you're going to increase your net profit by four cent. So therefore, if you increase it by um, maybe a ton, you're going to increase it by almost 50 euro. So um, the trade economic values then come from the agronomic advantage that I mentioned earlier on. And then that's multiplied by the economic value. That gives us the trade values within the pasture profit index. So um, now that I've introduced the PPI, I'm going to discuss the new developments for this year. And the main one of these is the new utilization sub index. And the first thing you can see here that it's done on a star rating of one to five, uh, as opposed to the economic values that the other traits are done in. So um, the grazing utilization, what is it or why is it brought in or why is it important? Um, so we want high quality pasture to feed the cows. That's going to increase the energy in the diet. That's going to increase the um, milk production uh, from those cows. And one of the key grassland management techniques that we use to increase the quality of um, swords is to um, graze tightly. So if you graze tightly to four centimeters, um, there's very little residual dry matter left. And therefore, that's not going to lignify in the next rotation. If you have a situation where you have this picture up top here in this slide, there's residual dry matter left there or there's herbage left behind. If, if the farmer just closes the gate on that and he comes back to him 21 days time, that leftover herbage is going to become stemmy. It's going to reduce the quality of that sward and therefore um, milk production will be lower from that sward. So when a farmer is faced with a sward like that, maybe they've stayed 36 hours in that paddock, but there's still herbage left behind, he or she is going to have a um, decision to make. And the management decisions are, he can either return the cows back to that paddock to finish grazing it, but then that's likely going to lead to him or her coming back at around 10 or 11 o'clock to move these cows onto the next field. That's outside of regular Mexican times, and it's, you know, it's a time cost, um, especially in the even times, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, the farmer can decide to top the graze pasture. Uh, that's going to give him a labour cost, so hours spent in the tractor. It's going to be a fuel cost to actually top it. And also, it's going to be a loss of grass. So you're after putting the input cost to grow that grass, and next thing you're just cutting it and allowing it to rot back into the ground. So that's, um, you know, it's not the best use of resources. 
be better if that was all grazed up or else the final decision that can be made is to close the paddock or not close the paddock just move on to the next paddock leave it grow for 21 days and instead of grazing it you can cut that for surplus bales in the next rotation and um, that probably is if you can do that every once and now again it probably is the way to go but um as we know not all paddocks can be cut for silage uh, you can't cut all paddocks in at the same time or else you'd be left with no grass for grazing or else there might be a steep hill or there might be stones in the paddock that uh, you just won't be able to cut it. So what, um, what farmers want, um, what we found is we have an on-farm variety trial where farmers are sowing individual varieties in their paddocks. And this trial started in about 2013. And um, uh, within the first year, one of the main feedbacks we got was that certain varieties were easier to graze out than others. And um, one of the other feedbacks then we got from the farmers was that if they're going out using the PPI to select varieties, they have no indication of what variety is going to be well grazed and what variety isn't going to be well grazed. And therefore, they pick a variety, they think it's going to be great, but they find the cows suff not suffer on them, but they sulk on them and they don't graze them down. And then um, they find after five or six years, it's better off to reseed those paddocks and actually keep them going. So um, based on that feedback um, that farmers wanted an indication of a variety's grazing ability on the PPI, we decided to investigate grazing efficiency differences between varieties uh, on a plot-based system here in Chagas Moor Park. You can see here in this photo, we have the plots laid out there. Uh, the cows have choice to graze whatever plot they want. Um, Cows are allocated just on 24 hours, what their intake is and what the grass cover is there. And then um, we'll see which ones are better grazed. So um, since we started doing this work, we sold a number of trials, uh, each evaluating different sets of varieties. So we evaluated the entire 2016 recommended list. And then new varieties also came onto the PPI since 2016. And we had a number of promising candidates in the list as well. So we sold them in 2018. And uh, we've also sold them in 2020. And um, about six weeks ago, we sold another 2021 sowing year with new varieties and candidates also. So these um, varieties are managed on a rotational basis. Grazed when um, pre-grazing cover on average is 1400 kilograms of dry matter. Um, and the protocol for this is we take a harvest cut, as you can see in the photo here, and that's going to give us a dry matter yield. Uh, I then take a pre-grazing swar height when, before the cows come in. The cows then go graze all the plots down as they wish. And then once the cows leave, uh, I'm taking a post-grazing swar height of each variety. And I suppose when we started the trial, the original thinking was, if one variety is grazed to four and a half centimeters and another variety is grazed to four centimeters, then the four centimeter variety is more grazing, is more utilizable, is more preferred by cows. But what we found is when we encountered this was that that wasn't necessarily fair to varieties. So you can imagine if you have a number of varieties sown side by side, they're going to grow at different rates because we know that certain varieties are better yielders than others. So therefore, when we went to graze these plots, some of the varieties um, had more herbage yield, could be at 1500 and other varieties could be at 1300. So we had to account for these pre-grazing differences because we know if a variety is at 1500, it's generally going to be less well grazed than a variety of 1300. So we, the example as here, we, we have pre-height in this model, but um, they interchange pre-grazing swart height and pre-grazing swart mass was so um, linked that uh, we went for pre-grazing swart height. We have variety one here. It's pre-grazing swart height is um, 9.25 centimeters. And therefore we predicted that that variety should be grazed to about 3.9 centimeter. And that's based off all the data that we have going back over the number of years. We then have variety two. Uh, it's pre-grazing sword height is 10.25 centimeters. It's a centimeter higher. And um, that variety is then predicted to be grazed higher to about 4.1 centimeters. So essentially we're giving variety two a bit more chance to be grazed higher while still, be, still being classed as grazing efficient. So how we use this predicted post-grazing sword height then is, so these varieties or these graphs are essentially three different traits. We have pre-grazing sward height in blue here. So variety one has a higher pre-grazing sward height than variety two. And therefore, as you would expect, um, 
the green bars here, the predicted post grazing support height of variety one is higher than uh, variety two. We then also have the actual post grazing support height of those varieties. So what the varieties actually did in the plots at a given rotation. And we can see here that variety one was grazed tighter than variety two. And that would have been unexpected because because of its higher pre-grazing support height, you would expect variety one to have a higher post-grazing support height, but it actually is a grazing efficient variety. So it's um, grazed tighter. So what we did with um, our predicted post-grazing support height is we subtract the predicted post-grazing support height of variety one from the actual post-grazing support height of that. So you can see here it's red bar minus green bar. So you can see for variety one, that's going to give us a negative value. And this value is called residual grade support height. And um, a negative value is what we want. So if a variety has a negative residual graze height value, that is good grazing efficiency. You can see here for variety two, its actual post grazing support height is higher than its predicted post grazing support height. It has a positive residual graze support height. Therefore, it has lower utilization. So this is a graph displaying the residual graze support height of varieties evaluated in the 2016 and the 2018 studies. So the varieties in the 2016 study were evaluated for three years. The varieties here in the 2018 study have, in this graph, have two years data to their name and are also being evaluated this year for their third year's grazing evaluation. Um, so to date, 52 varieties have been examined. We sold another 15 last year and we sold another 21 this year. So we are getting through quite a lot of varieties. Um, one of the main things that... Um, you'll see from this graph is that the tetrapoid varieties in the light green color, um, they are dominating the negative proportion of the graph, whereas our diploids are dominating the positive portion of the graph. And we can there then say that the tetrapoid varieties have higher, gr higher grazing efficiency or are capable of higher utilization than the diploid varieties. But you can also see that um, in the middle of the graph here, there is quite a bit of variation between tetrapoids and diploids. So just because a variety is a tetrapoid variety doesn't necessarily mean that it will be high grazing utilization. Now, it's definitely not going to be a poor grazing variety, but it just mightn't be as good as some of the other ones available on the market. So um, what we then did is created a utilization value based on residual grade support height. So I'll quickly go through this. If we have a variety with a negative residual grade support height, like variety one, that variety um, is grazed tighter, you're going to utilize more dry matter. So um, we multiply that 0.2 of a centimeter, multiply it by 250 kilograms of dry matter per centimeter. And then that's giving us an extra 50 kilograms of dry matter utilized per grazing. So at each grazing, you're going to utilize more dry matter, that's going to allow more cows to be fed, uh, or it's going to reduce the amount of concentrates you have to feed or reduce the amount of silage in the diet. We then multiply that by the eight grazing rotations that are assumed across the season. So on average, this is what farmers are achieving. So we went with eight grazing rotations. So 50 kilograms of dry matter multiplied by eight grazing rotations gives us a 400 kilograms of dry matter utilized extra across the year. We then multiply that extra 400 kilograms of dry matter by four cent per kilogram. That's um, essentially the summer economic value of dry matter. And seeing as we have more grazing events in um, summer and the fact that summer is when you really are going to see these grazing efficiency differences between varieties, uh, it's four cent per kilogram. And therefore that gives variety one a utilization value of 17 euro. Variety two, it has a positive uh, residual grade support height value. It's going to utilize less um, dry matter at each grazing rotation. Therefore it's going to utilize less uh, dry matter across the grazing system. That's going to lower your net profit, and that's going to give you a utilization and um, economic value of minus 11 for variety two. So as I said, the utilization star, um, the utilization index is um, expressed in a star rating system. This star rating system goes from one to five with a one star variety having a utilization range of minus 15 euro to minus nine euro, whereas our five star varieties are best grazing varieties have a utilization economic value of uh, plus nine euro to plus 16 euro. So this again is the pasture profit index for 2021. And uh, I'm just going to quickly run through 
how you should use the partial profit index when you're going to select varieties. So um, the first thing you need to do is decide on the use of the paddock. So you've decided you're going to reseed paddock seven on your farm. What is the main use of that paddock? So is that paddock on your grazing platform, number one? And then is it, is it located close to your milking parlor? Is it on the outside of the farm and you want to close it up for silage maybe at some stage during the grazing system? So if it's a predominantly grazing variety, you want to uh, graze it throughout the season, maybe take one um, surplus cut for bales off it, you're going to be picking for a grazing variety. And the traits you need to be selecting for, for those varieties is the quality sub-index, because the higher the quality, the more energy in the diet for the cows, the greater milk production. The utilization uh, sub-index, so you want varieties with high star ratings. Uh, generally, I would be uh, telling farmers and um, the industry to pick varieties that are three stars or higher based on grazing. And then lastly, you want to pick varieties with good enough um, yield potential, but particularly spring yield potential, because spring yield, if you have a variety with higher spring yield, it's going to, um, you're going to displace the amount of concentrates and silage you have to feed during that point of the year. That's going to increase your net profit. Um, Secondly, then, if you have a variety that you're going to pick for silage, so this variety is located on an out farm, you're using it to uh, create your winter feed, uh, or else you're going to be, it's maybe located far away from the, the milking parlor and you're going to close it up for six to seven weeks during the grazing season. Um, you're going to be picking based on the silage some of the things. So that's going to tell you these varieties are uh, more likely to give you high silage yields. And then you also want to pick on the uh, spring sub index because varieties high in spring also tend to be high in the silage sub index also. You also may want to pick varieties, a bit of grazing maybe for heifers on the out farm while also going for silage. Then you want to maybe pick a variety that's also performing well in the uh, utilization sub index as well to give you the best of both worlds, a kind of general purpose type paddock. So in summary, um, I've been talking about the pasture profit index. So it's a variety selection tool. It's used by the um, by all actors within the um, grassland seed industry. So it's used by farmers when selecting. It's used by seed merchants when um, maybe picking what varieties they want to put in their bespoke seed mixers. So they're going to have their um, seed mixtures, high grazing seed mixer. They're going to pick high quality, high grade utilization. It's used by breeders because breeders want um, varieties that are going to perform well for farmers and perform well in the actual PPI. So they're um, developing varieties that are high in quality, high in utilization, uh, maintaining good yields. So that's how breeders are using the pasture profit index. Um, the new utilization sub index was introduced for 2021. Uh, so this index was demanded by farmers. Based on the feedback we were, we were getting back from farmers, um, we decided to pursue getting this trait into the pasture profit index. And since its introduction back at the start of this year, the feedback we've been getting is strong. Uh, feedback from farmers, they like that. They have an indication how well this variety is going to be grazed. Advisors like going out to farmers and having more confidence in uh, choosing varieties for farmers. So um, feedback has been very strong. And um, we always have to be thinking about the future. If we're not, if we're not improving the index, uh, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. So we need to start looking towards the future. And this is going to focus on new traits within the index. These are likely going to be maybe focused around an environmental focus. So can we um, reward varieties maybe with more energy in the diet or a greater balance between high protein and high energy? That's going to reduce nitrogen excretion from the cows. That's an environmental benefit. Um, and also we're going to be um, developing new species in the indexes, indexes. So we're going to be uh, looking at maybe a clover profit index, looking at the clover varieties that are currently evaluated by the department, creating an index for those, which uh, will be focused on dry matter yield, uh, quality, is the, are certain varieties of clover going to give us higher quality in the sward? Uh, and also maybe do some clover varieties, fix more nitrogen or give more benefits um, to the sward, uh, and that's our kind of plans for the future. So thank you for your attention, and um, I welcome any questions you have here now. Uh, and if not, if you think of some in the future, or you just want to chat about um, all things varieties and stuff like that, uh, you can contact me or McDonald.
Thanks very much. Very good, Tomas. That's excellent. Uh, thanks very much. So it's uh, it's kind of complex in a way in terms of the work that you have to do to get to the star rating, but you've gone through that quite well there and explaining it. Because I remember the first time I saw the, the slides on paper, I was scratching my head. I was like, how, is there, how are they coming up with this? But um, So just to kick off the questions in, in case uh, there's one in there now, um, just a question for myself in terms of, is there any risk with the, the really well grazed out swords that they're compromised in terms of total yield or anything like that? You know, if they've been really clipped off every time. Yeah, so it's one thing we found in the plot trials. Um, but you can imagine, Stuart, if we have variety X and it's really, really well grazed, cows love grazing it, and you have variety Y, which cows just do not like grazing it. What I found when I was grazing these trials is variety X was grazed to four centimetres nearly straight away. And it was grand, and then the cows would go off, look for other varieties. But you'd come back then and the variety wise that the cows just never really like grazing. They'd be at six centimetres, five and a half centimetres, and you couldn't take the cows out of the field when, when the plots were like that. So you'd give the cows a couple more hours to try graze down those high, those higher plots. But what I found is then that your variety X's, the high grazing ones, would be further grazed down to maybe three and a half centimetres. And only once then, once they were grazed down really tight, you'd be grazed down to, uh, they grazed the other ones to a respectable post grazing sward of about four and a half. But you can imagine if, you've, if you're you grazing varieties constantly to three and a half centimetres, they are going to be pinched and kneeled. That's what is one thing we found in the plot trials. If you're not having the same kind of residual on these, um, on the swords, you can't really um, measure herbage yield all that well. But thankfully we have the department trials, they use a cutting system. They're all going to be grazed to, um, raised to a similar height yeah. and whereas our other one so then that's going into the ppi whereas our um grazing plots they're just giving us one source of information and that's the grazing utilization sub index also i would say if you're sowing one of these high grazing varieties the cows are obviously not going to have a choice so you're going to allocate them to graze your 1400 1500 cover down to four centimeters then they'll be taken off um, I suppose we didn't have the same luxuries that that's why they're getting overgrazed. But if you see that the sward is grazed four centimetres, you'll pull the cows off it. So therefore, having that even half centimetre difference makes a big difference in the sward's ability to start regrowing straight away. Yeah, there's just leaf content there for it to get going. So exactly. like in reality, so in your grazing trial work, you're pinching them a small bit in terms of yield, but your department listing is going to... That's, it's, a, it's not it optimal make... management. Yeah. essentially like you, we'd rather just graze them the four centimeter than take the cows off but when you have that variation um they are just going to be that bit um you know pinched i'd say yeah okay fair enough so there's just um one uh there's two questions here at the moment now. So, is there evidence of differences in nitrogen use or nutrient use efficiency of the different varieties so it almost is captured in the yield index yield. within the department so like all the varieties in the department get the same amount of nitrogen. And therefore, if a variety is yielding more in the 21 days after that, it's likely that it's naturally higher growing, better at utilizing that nitrogen. Now, we also need to look at the nitrogen, the crude protein content in these varieties, which we do measure, and there isn't that much of a difference between them. But obviously, if you have a variety that's able to use the nitrogen and push it towards growth, as opposed to uptake the nitrogen, and put it towards crude protein, we'd rather select varieties that push it towards growth. And then there's um, another one here. If a grass has a strong uh, spring PPI, will that mean that it will have an early head out date and lose quality during the summer? And um, that tends to be the case. So you will see Which that- Which is why you're saying that they tend to have a good silage performance then as well. They do. Your intermediate varieties, like traditionally, you. Traditionally, back in the day, we wouldn't stick in. If you were picking for your silage ones, pick based more intermediates um, and stuff like that. Now, within grazing and stuff like that, I haven't found much of a difference between lates and intermediates, but it is your varieties that are heading out earlier. You know, it's going to head out earlier. You're going to a peak yield. You want to keep the digestibility up. So your intermediates are going to pull your digestibility down that bit much. But also there's an argument that back back maybe 20 years ago certain varieties were more inclined to head out you'd cut them or graze them and then they'd head out again 
And they were really bad quality varieties, essentially. Whereas breeders now will be selecting towards varieties that they may head out on a certain date, but so long as they don't get these secondary heading, you know, that's a better trait than just one heading date, you know? Yeah, okay. And um, just uh, a clarification then as well, I know it is something that uh, you've discussed with you before as well, just in terms of the persistency figure for the whole PPI, will you just, I, I, I'm assuming that people that are tuned in are probably looking at that when they look at the PPI and saying like it's zero all the time nearly with the exception of one or two on the list pretty much. Will you just explain why that is the case? So persistency is based off, we want each variety to last 12 years because generally 12 years is just great. You're not reseeding, so you're saving money that way. But then after 12 years, you know, there's so much genetic gain, it's nearly time to start reseeding, getting newer, better cultivars in. That's why we pick 12 years. And some of these varieties will last beyond 12 years. Um, how the persistency index is calculated is based off ground score change. So ground score is the, the amount of perennial ryegrass tillers in the sward relative to the amount of open space. And it's not just pure ground score, it's ground score decline. So they're measured at establishment, they're measured at the end of their first year, and they're measured at the end of their second year of evaluation. And it's the rate of decline that we're seeing in those plots is then modeled out over a longer term period, such that the rate of decline is related back to loss in dry matter yield, and when that dry matter yield goes below six and a half ton, that variety is redundant. What we're seeing with our varieties is that their rate of decline is so little that those varieties over 12 years are not going to, their yield isn't going to go below six and a half ton. And therefore, we're happy enough to say that these varieties are persistent. Uh, another thing, like it was always taught that tetraploids had lower persistency than diploids. <clears throat> what we would see is that tetraploids from establishment have a lower ground score, but actually that the rate of decline is somewhat less than that of diploids, such that by year, maybe four or five, their ground scores are generally, maybe more six, their ground scores are generally the same. So the rate of decline is higher in the diploids, but um, the reason then for the euro values of zero is that all the varieties as evaluated now, Stuart, are going to last for 12 years. That's under good management, you know, yes, I have to say it's definitely going to last, but under good management, these varieties are going to last 12 years. And you see that with most perennial ryegrass varieties, um, you know, across the country anyway, once they're well managed, getting their nitrogen, you know, not too high covers and, you know, getting a good kind of um, spray after receiving, you know, post-emergent spray, the docks shouldn't come into them and then, um, um, they will last that long. Yeah, very good. Um, just in terms of the, I suppose we still advocate that people uh, use a mix of seeds. Do you, see, you, you probably don't have information on it, but we'll say, how do you find, is there a level of interaction in with your grazing utilization piece in terms of how they, they work at farm level? We'll say, do they, they complement one another? Do they, can they kind of contradict one another? Maybe now I'm asking you to speculate maybe a small bit in that one, but what do you mean? Do you mean? You know, with, I would say if you combine, farm? you combine a really good grazing index one with a maybe oh, yeah. a less good grazing. So, like you're saying, to use a three star plus, like, but if you happen to have a two star uh, along with a five star, do you get the, the happy medium maybe in between? You do. The, so, we did, and a half? we did, um, we conducted plot trials on that. I can, we ran for three years, and um, it's like you're getting the happy medium, and it's not in groundbreaking in that research but it's then looking at what do you want from your sward. So like you're trying to, you want a sward with good yield, a high yield you can get, good quality and good grazing. So if you're picking a five star variety, and one star variety, you're pulling it back to a three star, but really you want to push that towards a four star. If not, you know, you want to get it as high as possible. And it's the, the question is kind of, are you diluting the performance of your good variety? So if you have one variety that's given you good graze out, good yield and good quality, maybe you're better off just sowing that one variety um, as opposed to mixing, you, you have these specialist varieties, one's good on graze and one good on quality, one's good on yield, but you're really only coming back to the pack then and looking for kind of pushing it on, not the medium, just above the medium nearly, if you get me. And then, sure. um, so we did it on a number of traits, we did it on the yield traits, we did it on the quality traits, we did it on the grazing traits. And, there was never any real 
no mixture ever outperformed the best variety of that mixture, if you get me. So it's yeah, always yeah. around the average of that. But, you know, it gives you confidence to mix these varieties. You're, you're definitely never going to go below the, um, the average. But um, sometimes if one variety is going to do it for you, I, if you're comfortable so on one variety, I'd so one variety. Like the guys we have on the on-farm trial, if they find a variety they like, like it works well for them. They're happy. Very good. Okay, so I oh, just one more after coming in. Uh, what's your view on over sowing and the grazing block using three varieties, tetraploid five star with two kgs of clover? Um, it's not as good as a full reseed, is my opinion. It depends, like, what is the reason for it? Are you reseeding a 10 or 12 year old paddock? Like, there's going to be annual meadowgrass and stuff in the base of that, and that really is going to do better from. Um, a full reseed, you can get dung out on it, get a good lime out on it. You can do, you can fix a lot of problems by doing a full reseed. And what we find, especially from a clover point of view, is that the establishment is more certain, it's more reliable from a full reseed. Overseeding, say if you maybe sowed in 2018 and it was a patchy reseed in the drought or something like that, it's generally still going to be dominated by perennial ryegrass and might just look open. In that case, overseeding might be a very good job. Definitely kind of go for more tetraplide varieties. They're more aggressive. They'll grow upright. Um, and then <clears throat> hopefully the clover will come with it too. The only thing is overseeding, it's very weather dependent. You really do need ideal conditions and none of us can actually predict the weather all that well. So you can just get, you can get very lucky with an excellent overseeding job or you can just get very unlucky, get very low levels of clover salvage if the weather doesn't go with you. And you might not, you might fill in a couple of gaps with your primary ryegrass, but it won't fill in. It mightn't be the best. It could work perfect, but it mightn't either. Um, and uh, just, I suppose, before I go to the next and final question, I suppose um, my take on the overseeding is that it's it's a, a two to three year kind of quick fix maybe scenario for you. If uh, in some cases people take on extra land and they can't justify maybe receiving the whole lot of it straight away or whatever. But there's, it's costing when you kind of taking contractor charges into it, it could be costing up to 90 or 100 euro with seed and all included. So it's quite expensive. And as you said, the, the, there's a big risk around the ability of it to actually prefer, to take or not. Like, so yeah, from, from my perspective, I'd agree with you 100% in it, Tomas. Yeah. So the final question then, Tomas, and we'll let you go out in. Um, is there any benefit to using anti poaching varieties around gaps and water troughs? And very detailed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What is an anti-poaching variety is the question. Like, so back to the years, it was taught your diploids are going to give you, they're going to keep the cows up and stuff like that. But um, I don't know anti -poaching. So it'll keep the cows up. But like you're losing so much, not losing so much, it's variety specific. But we find that tetraids are better grazed. So like, what do you want? Poaching is going to affect you at the start of the year and the end of the year generally. And it is more of a management thing. Um, I'm not sure any variety is really anti post Like if you have your water truck in the middle of the field, there is going to be a ring around it where the cows are walked. Uh, on, and I don't think any variety is going to really withstand that. Around gaps and that, should we know cows and wet weather, they'll stand at the gap and ball to be brought in. And what that is nearly needed to, to believe is if you're sowing a high tetraploid variety, the cows like grazing. If you're going to conduct on off grazing, put the cows into this tetraploid or high grazing efficiency sward and um, cows will go in heads will go down they'll graze they'll graze two or three hours as soon as the heads come up you know that field is grazed and you can pull them back in with the likes of these poor diploids it's going to take there was research done here in Moor Park where um, it was taking cows an extra hour to an hour and a half longer to actually graze those swards down to the proper residual that's an extra hour it's generally what you'll find is the heads will go down for two hours and next thing the heads will go up and they'll start walking wires looking for the next nicest piece and nicest piece and it's that walking of wires and walking towards the gap and stuff like that that's going to cause the poaching more than the variety actually keeping the cows up or not if you haven't open enough diploid cows will lick it and you can pull them off it and i think that's a it's your management that's going to dictate how much poaching is going on there rather than um the variety that you've sown 100% like we work coming back from the heavy soils program with James Lachlan and John Maher and so forth and Mick would be involved in that as well would have shown that the, the lads actually would are now nearly demanding those high tetraploids rather than the diploid varieties that they were initially looking at 
just to get a grade and all. And that, that's that's the way to yeah, go. It was the same in Bally Hayes. I remember talking to Donald up there and they had a dip light kind of on a floodplain. You'd only get maybe a window of four days in March to graze it. And the cows go in and just sulk on it for the days you were grazing it. Whereas he's receded it since with a tetraploid. And cows go in, they go out. It grows back very fast, grows back from very good quality. And by the second rotation, then it's a perfect sward on their farm. Yeah, so, and I suppose the final thing on the water troughs then would be, I think, a good surface around the water troughs is probably a big contributor to reducing uh, soiling and damage around water troughs. Like you said, they're going to stand around there at the same time, so you, there's only so much you can do, but... Exactly, not having leaking and stuff like that might be better, having a good true. setup as well. Exactly, yeah, not muddy around them anyway in the first place as well. Yeah. So, Tomas, thanks very much for coming on. Um, just, uh, just to tell people that uh, this is recorded and will be going out again on, on Twitter and uh, or it will be on the Chag's website, sorry. Um, and Emma Louise will have it as a bonus podcast there. In, in It'll probably be two to three weeks now because Roderick O'Connor that uh, does the editing for me is just on leave at the moment. Um, when I mention Emma Louise as well, just to mention her podcasts, uh, she's done a good one with Francis Bloyd, a health and safety officer with Chag is uh, given that this week is health and safety week. So just identifying risks on farm is an important piece for people uh, I suppose in taking a, a minute to just judge the job before you tear into it to avoid any risk of anybody getting hurt and just to remind people also of the this is dairy competition so I just checked that out in Chagas website it's a photo competition and um, that are taking entries at the moment so uh, next week I'll be talking to the lads in grass 10 in relation to building cover for autumn uh, 2021 and that's a very very important thing for people to tune into because we seem to be making a dog's dinner of building covers in the autumn at farm level so uh, we look forward to talking to you next week and thanks a million again to Moss. that was a great presentation thank you no bye thanks, everyone take, take care and stay safe that's all for this week's let's talk dairy webinar series and don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week i'll be back with our usual dairy edge interview on monday so do listen in then i'm emma louise coffee and thanks for listening